Welcome to another episode of The Local Dive. This is Alex Scott, joined by only Ashlyn Portero today. <laughs> How's it going? Hello, good. Good. We're Dean. two men down today. Yeah, Dean is uh, with his son, oldest son, Tommy, and they're at uh, the Big 12 Baseball tournament and uh watching a bunch of baseball as we record this so um, enjoying some some time away and uh jacob baldry is i don't i don't know where he is but he he wasn't available so (laughs) has um, he quit have we finally driven him away yeah i was gonna make a joke about him probably being at like the gym or something and then i was like (laughs) wait maybe that's why he's not here he just doesn't you know he he couldn't take any more um you know any more uh Gold, golden golden calf jokes <laughs> um, jokes right okay some got gentle it. some gentle chiding uh but uh oh, man. yeah so excited to uh jump into kind of what we set up last week when we talked about esther and god's sovereignty and salvation and as we um over the next five weeks i think we're going to take a break uh, at some point in them to talk about denominations but uh we want to dive into uh the the doctrines of grace there's kind of five doctrines or points within uh, you know god's plan for salvation that we'll uh spend uh, you know each of the next five weeks talking about uh, and today uh, it'll be the first one which will be total depravity and so um we'll be excited to to jump into that and we'll we'll, we'll set up really what are the doctrines of grace what are those five things before we jump into uh the, you know at the, at the start of the deep dive before we really jump into uh total depravity today but um in, in true, you know, local dive fashion will be in the shallow end first. So I just want to say, first of all, how did we get so serious that now we're having a five week series on the doctrines of grace and we're interrupting it? Like our break is denominations. I don't know. <laughs> we need a lot of shallow end yeah, apparently to counteract. The pool is going to need to come uh, back at some point. Yeah. So I think maybe that's, maybe that's probably counteracting like the, the yeah. <laughs> what was the kiddie pool. And yeah, we're like, we, hold we on. We swung we gotta, too far in the other direction. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta make a hard turn in the other direction. So, um, yeah, so in uh, in in shallow end fashion, talking about depravity, <laughs> where are the areas <laughs> where where you are most aware of your depravity? Oh man, um, okay, keeping it shallow because I'm not yeah. about to make that. Like this isn't like confession time, right? <laughs> right, we're not like you know on the on the therapist's couch. Okay, like, this is like Harry Potter where secrets. you like peer into the thing where you can see all your thoughts. Um, I am very aware of my depravity when I'm driving. I, I'm i a judgmental driver. Once I cross the 30 threshold, I now have no fear in honking at people. 30 like miles an hour? No, 30 years old. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I was like, uh. so I'm com- Part of me coming into my 30s has become, has been involved uh, being a more aggressive driver. So I just, it's a good thing. I don't have a city church bumper sticker I was like, you, you won't honk at 20, but you, you know, 32, you're, you're, you know, you're letting it They say you're rip. more comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. So nice. uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a judgmental driver. What, what are the, um, the things like, what are the things that will set you off on the road most, you know, like. I kind of have a lead foot. Okay. Um, so slow drivers are not my favorite. And even though I am a honker, it drives me crazy when people honk like the second the light turns green. Oh, that is the worst. It is. And I I understand now we're living in the age of cell phones where like I think they should just change all traffic lights to like add an extra five seconds because it's just a given now that it's going to turn green and you're not going to move for like five seconds. Let me finish my text. Exactly. While everybody looks up from the article that they're reading at a stoplight. Um, But that just like drives me crazy. So... Yeah, that's uh, that's maybe the worst, like the most egregious kind of. It's like it turns green and you honk immediately. It's like you're not in that big of a rush. Like it's it's okay. Yeah, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah, uh, mine I- is like I think I'm most aware of it when I'm judging people <laughs> on uh, on social media, like <laughs> as I scroll and and I generally like I feel like I've curated my feed fairly well to where I'm not perpetually annoyed by somebody because if I am, I use the mute and or block function. Um, and in general, my rule is if I think I'm going to unfollow you in like a month, I'm just not going to follow you to start. Um, but so no, you know, no, uh, no sympathy follow. Although Facebook, that's like whatever, I'll accept a friend request from, you know, anybody, but which Facebook is just human depravity on display. (laughs) Yes. Uh, yeah, I was going to say social media in general might be, um, but, uh, the, 
so yeah, I mean, I'm definitely like very judgmental of people. I mean, like, I don't care that your second grader like finished school and you called it graduated. Like, I'm just like that. That's just annoying to me. And like, it's like, stop. I mean, great. They get to go on to third, I, you know, they get to go on to third grade. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> you know, so it, it's great. I mean, I'm, I don't know. Somebody's going to like play this back when Colin, you know, finishes a grade and but hey, we you post will it, be but... there and you'll probably take the picture too. Yeah, and it's a rite of passage. I feel like I'm fine with taking the picture. I just am like, hmm, do you really need to post that? But you know, so that's one area um, where most certainly uh, that would be. And then I think, like in general, the things that I think but don't say, <laughs> you know, well, like yes. oftentimes I mean, I think that's kind of everybody. But yeah, I'm like, oh. Golly, that's that's not good. But uh <laughs> I think another place where I am aware of my depravity, but I also feel like it is on display is at airports. So <sighs> like I am never more my pride <laughs> is never larger than when I am going through security. Like I don't know what it is, but when the person like gets petty with like how I put my suitcase through the thing or like the TSA. Yes. Person. Like I don't accept correction from TSA agents very well. I've learned this about myself, you know, and it's, but it's like, that's literally their job. Like basically yeah. what I'm saying when I get huffy is like, how dare you person who has, you know, been trained and is literally paid to do what you're telling me to do. Well, like, there's like an 82% chance based on the times we've all traveled as a staff that like you're now standing barefoot in the line. Right. Because and because usually, you yeah. made a poor footwear <laughs> decision like earlier so in the day. True. Like you based it off your outfit, not the fact that you're going to have to walk barefoot <laughs> through TSA. And so, so I mean, I feel like, you know, when that happens, it's okay to be a little salty. I mean, that's another way that, you know, probably I just am not, just not functioning at my highest capacity <laughs> oh yeah i think maybe like waiting for people to get off of a plane is like peak like i'm annoyed um but but do you do the thing where you stand up and you're like hunched under the like overhead bin because that mm, always kills me no when it's I, like the six foot tall guy and he, but he's just like you know can't even stand up all the way i'm like sir just sit down yeah. like it's as okay. a general rule i try not to sit under the overhead bins like i want to be on the aisle <laughs> right. um mostly because then i can like at least stretch a leg <laughs> um i am the person who like gets up right away not because i'm worried about getting off the plane faster i just am tired of sitting yeah um and so I know some people get annoyed by that. They're like, dude, just stay seated five more minutes. Like, does standing in the aisle really make it better? Um, and hey, when your legs are cramped. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, it kind of does. I'm, I, you know, I get some blood flow moving again. But, um, but I just, it's like, why, why does it take so long? And then, or the person who had like got on the plane late, they, the only overhead bin space was like you know, row 37 and they were sitting oh, in 22 yeah, that's the worst. and they try and like salmon their way. It's like, no, just like no, at that you point, can't swim upstream yeah, on a plane. No, you've paid the late, you're paying the late tax and you're waiting for everybody to get off before. So yes, hardcore judgment of those people. <laughs> I judge people in the airport. I'm, like when did it become acceptable to travel? Like in pajamas. <laughs> like, oh gosh. I mean, the things that people choose to travel in, I'm like, No, why? it's like you are a grown adult. You should be able to put on uh, what, what culture now refers to as hard pants, <laughs> not sweatpants, but like jeans or it doesn't have to be trousers or chinos or whatever your preferred, you know, pant that zips and buttons is. But, but SpongeBob like, PJs does no. not need to be the answer That's either. Bad. Like, um, yeah, so I don't know. I'm, I'm probably very judgy in those moments but um yeah i, I think we'll just stop it there um before <laughs> before before i get more annoyed by people who don't care what i think and have <laughs> you know really no bearing on my i mind. also like how we just definitely turned this into like it's other people's fault oh, <laughs> like for sure. other people provoke my total depravity it's like not i i didn't talk about anything that just is well i guess maybe driving but no i still blame that on other people like it's their inability to drive about, that right. leads you to be upset. Yeah. And so that's, your, you know, you're depra- I'm just judgy. Like, I mean, it's that, like, that's where I'm depraved. I'm just like, uh, really? Like that, that was your choice today? Like yeah. you paid $350 for a flight and $4 for your outfit? Oh, like, man. I don't know. Um, so anywho, well, as we transition into uh, the deep dive and we uh, kind of spend the first 
you know, portion of this thinking about the doctrines of grace. These are typically, you know, the, the doctrines around God's sovereign plan of salvation, typically from a reformed tradition. Uh, often people hear about this in the context of Calvinism. Um, and there's, you know, lots of sometimes boogeymen with that word. Uh, but, you know, so as, as we think about them, there's, there's sort of five main uh, doctrines that we're going to be working through in the context uh, of these, you know, of, of God's sovereignty and salvation. Uh, there's an acronym called TULIP uh, that has been used to describe these uh, five points of Calvinism or the doctrines of grace. And those are total depravity, that's the T, unconditional election, limited atonement, uh, irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints. And so those those five uh doctrines of grace that, that make up the TULIP acronym uh, are where we'll spend the next uh, handful of weeks kind of discussing those doctrines. And as we dive into today's topic of total depravity, um, Ashlyn, maybe can you sort of set the stage for when we think about uh, total depravity and when we talk about that over the next few minutes, uh, what do we mean by that? And what are some ways that uh, we can help frame what total depravity is and maybe what it isn't as well? Sure. So, I would recommend for anyone who is just learning about the doctrines of grace or who, uh, you know, beyond this podcast, obviously, this is a really drilled down, like brief discussion of um, of total depravity. And then as we go on of the doctrines of grace, um, Ligonier Ministries, which is R.C. Sproul's teaching ministry, has an incredible amount of resources on this where you can really read about it in understandable, you know, language. Um Obviously, we're engaging with the, you know, the the teachings and the thoughts of John Calvin, but, you know, R.C. Sproul is <laughs> able to, to articulate a lot of these things in a, a more modern way. Um, and the modern godfather of yeah, Reformed maybe you could theology, say that. maybe, I don't know. Um, so anyways, I, I just offer that, but, but uh, one of the ways that R.C. Sproul refers to total depravity is, in his words, he, he calls it... Uh, the biblical view of human sinfulness. And so that's, to me, a a really simple, understandable way uh, to think about total depravity. And so it's just the notion that all of us, all of humanity, is born in in sin nature, in in a nature of sin. Uh, and so it's not that we are good people who just have some problems. Uh, it's not that we are, you know, people who uh, we, we choose to sin, but we also have some innate, you know, goodness or, or capacity uh, that, that is somehow not uh, touched by sin. All of us, um, Psalm 51, David says, in sin did my mother conceive me. And, and I think what he's suggesting there is, you know, that, that we are born into sin and we are born sinful people. Um, you know, we, we are dead in our sins. And so in, in understanding total depravity, and, and we'll get into this more uh, in, I think, in a few minutes, talking about how that, that doesn't mean that we don't have value and worth as human beings, right? As people created in God's image, we'll, we can touch on that a little more. But uh, that that phrase, you know, the, the biblical view of human sinfulness in, in regards to a definition of total depravity is helpful for me in just understanding uh, that scripture tells us. It, it, we're basically saying total depravity is what scripture tells us that we have, you know, mm-hmm. that, that we are totally depraved. Um, there, there is no... There is no one righteous, as scripture says, and there is no one, you know, particle in us that is righteous in our own merit apart from uh, the the work of Christ. So I think that, I think that's, you know, a, a brief kind of summary. Yeah, I, I think that really does help set the the table well, um, kind of for the the rest of the conversation. And I think you know one of the things is as we were kind of preparing for this, um, John Piper and he t- he has uh, there's an, a, a teaching series on the Desiring God uh, website that he where he works through uh, these these points. And one of the things when talking about um, total depravity, he says our rebellion or hardness against God is total. And that is apart from the grace of God, there is no delight in the holiness of God. And there is no glad submission to the sovereign authority of God. And I think that that was just, again, helpful in thinking like, you know, obviously, like, we, I mean, the scriptures tell us that it affects every human, I think you can look at the world and say, yeah, clearly, like there's depravity everywhere. Right. Um, and, And so, 
it, it, it's easy to, to see that, but I think sometimes that modifier of total um, gets mixed up with, the, you know, R.C. Sproul talks about the difference between total depravity and utter depravity. Yes. Um, and so utter depravity, as, as Sproul thinks about that, is more of this idea that like everything's as bad as, bad as it could be, um, where total depravity is not that everything or every person is as bad as they could be, but right. rather that every, like every aspect of this world, apart from Christ and his redemption of, uh, you know, his people is totally affected by, by sin and its nature. And that we are born into that, like that, you know, Psalm, Psalm 51. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, that we think about in that, so, you know, the scriptures tell us that we are, you know, Ephesians 2, that we are dead in sin, um, that, you know, so as we think about being dead in sin and then coming to, you know, because this is in the context of um, God's sovereignty and salvation, how does depravity and, and total depravity, this kind of, you know, hardness of heart towards the Lord being dead in sin play into God's plan for salvation? And what does that, like, what are some of the, maybe practical implications and theological implications of, uh, of depravity in relation to, uh, into, to salvation? That's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I, I think one, it completely humbles us. You know, it, uh, we, we have to be able to see salvation as completely a free gift of grace and mercy from God. And, and also, and we'll get into this, uh, you know, salvation you know ordained and and orchestrated and accomplished by God you know so uh, it's not even that uh, our eyes are open you know but we just have to you know we kind of need a little help getting there no we're we're dead in our sins our eyes are completely closed Um, if you read you know Romans 3 uh, let me just read you know a few verses Romans 3 starting in Uh, Verse 11, uh, Paul writes, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Um, And I mean, and and you can continue, even verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And so I think that just kind of gives that like final, you know, (laughs) final answer of there is nothing in us. Uh, that that allows us to sort of bring ourselves to salvation or to even want that or to know what it is. Um, it, now, I do think, you know, God has uh, has put, you know, a, a touch of eternity in the heart of every person, mm-hmm. you know, that that he's created each person. Uh, you know, their cre- people are created in the image of God and, and made for God. Um, and, and there's a lot of mystery here, too, in, in the things that we're talking about. Um, but But it's not so that, you know, we just have to, you know, okay, then we have to get ourselves there or anything like that. That, you know, the Holy Spirit absolutely has to open our eyes. Has, you know, God calls us to himself. And so I think um, it, in a sense, it humbles us and, I mean, and really just, gosh, lays us flat, you know, before God uh, to, to know that we are completely and totally in our sin. We're, we're helpless, you know, before God. And, and, and I think for me, as I, you know, sort of dwell on that, it also makes God so much bigger than he often is in my mind. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. we, we sort of shrink God down or, you know, or, or we recreate him and in, in our revision him in our image. Uh, but if I am completely and utterly lost <laughs> before the God of the universe, that's a terrifying reality, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I'm so grateful for the grace of God uh, to have opened my eyes and, and to uh, have done for me what I couldn't do for myself. So those are, those are some sort of reflections, I think, as we uh, think about salvation um, and, and then I think we also have to see every uh, glimmer of, um, you know, if, if there's someone in your life that you're sharing the gospel with or that you're having conversations with and uh, there there is some kind of, uh, you know, being pointed toward or, or curiosity or whatever, we have to see those as uh, things as, as glimmers of hope, you know, in the sovereign work of God and, and you know, pray and and trust and and ask God to do his will in the lives of the people that we know and 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 trust him you know to to save who he's going to save um and so I think you know we 
it, it, it can be a scary and overwhelming thought, but also to know that uh, we we are not God, but we know that God is loving and merciful and that he does, you know, he He is faithful to carry out the plans that he has in salvation. Um, and, and for those of us in Christ, we, we know that and we've seen that in our own lives. And so um, we can trust those things to him. Yeah. As you were talking, one of the things that came to mind for me was the this idea that as I think about you know, my own depravity in the sense of being, being saved, um, from my sin and the inability to do it apart from Christ, uh, it, it often will reframe my view of God. And I think like there, there's this, you know, oftentimes the, the alternate viewpoint of this would be that there is some, you know, that sin, like depravity is generally accepted, amongst, you know, kind of any Christian position in salvation. Like the people will say, yes, of course we're depraved. But the, the, the sort of counter argument is, well, there is some ability for us to respond. There is some, you know, part of our will that is free to choose, um, to choose God and to respond to, you know, the, the message apart from, uh, you know, apart from the Lord doing that work in us. And to, to me, it, when I think about, okay, I was, as the scriptures say, dead in my sin, you know, I think of 1 Corinthians 2, it says the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. And so, like, as, an, as a non-believer before the Lord worked in me, like, even, even my righteous acts, you know, righteous in air quotes, um, they may have been morally in the context of our world good, but, you know, like, like Piper said, there, there was no joy and no seeking the glory of God in those things. And so the, the ability for me to sometimes f- like think about my view of God in light of what he's done and the way he saved me, I think it actually gives us a right view and a much bigger view, like you were saying, of, of the Lord and who he is. And it takes yeah. us kind of out of like framing him in a way that maybe feels right and feels familiar because like in my sin, I don't, I don't want to choose the Lord. And so, um, the fact that, I was, you know, I was dead. I, I didn't want the things of the spirit. I, you know, I was in active rebellion against him. Like I was never going to choose him, uh, you know, apart from him kind of choosing and uh, me and allowing, you know, there to be regeneration so that I would respond to the grace that he has shown me. And so I think like when we think about, you know, this, I, this doctrine of total depravity, it actually allows us to have a bigger view of God than, Mm -hmm. you know, and a, and a, and a, and a rightly smaller view of ourselves. Um, but I think there's a temptation and maybe some of this is American context and maybe not, but where we think, you know, we can just, if, if I just try harder, I can do it. And and, in reality, this doctrine in a sense says like, there's nothing that we contribute to our salvation except the sin that, you know, I forget who, who said that originally, the sin that makes it necessary. Um, and so there's no way that I was going to do that. And so I think it helps us to rightly see God, uh, for who he is and give us kind of that framework, uh, to see, you know, uh, God as much bigger than, than something, you know, that we would on our own or if we were contributing in some way to, to that. Right. Well, and I can imagine someone, you know, hearing the, hearing about total depravity and, and, um, that reality, you know, for the first time or, or just maybe more deeply considering it. I think another question or maybe like a pushback would come up that could come up would be, you know, okay, well, well, if we all are, are totally depraved, um, then, you know, how is that fair that we should be, because we're still under God's wrath, right? Like, because we're totally depraved, you know, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. Um, you know, how, how then, then what, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's the reality of our lostness. And I think that's the, the urgency, you know, to, to share the gospel and for people to, um, you know, to, to pray and to ask, um, I think, R.C. Sproul and something I was reading said, you know, for, for us to be quickened by the Holy Spirit, you know, mm-hmm. um, that just to, just to ask God to, to, you know, to invade the lives of, of people and open their, open their eyes. Um, but we see in Romans 1 that even when uh, truths about God uh, are are shown to people, you know, and even if you think about like creation, you know, if you look at a uh, sunrise or the beach or whatever, and you know, you say, I know that there has to be a God, um, but but that's not, you know, professing Jesus Christ as Lord. And so, and and Romans one says that, um, 
you know, for, for what can be known, this is verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them uh, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Um, and yet, even when we are shown glimpses of God in our sin, we suppress, as Romans says, we su- suppress the truth of God uh, and we worship idols. And so um, it, it goes beyond you know, the the condition that we are born into, you know, totally uh, dead in sin. And, and we see that work out into our lives, how um, even when, you know, God's truth, it kind of comes in, you know, invades our own our own world or our own minds uh, in our sinfulness. And, and even into uh, the, the Christian life, you know, we're still battling against sin uh, we're still battling against you know the the flesh that remains until the new creation and so um we're, we're constantly you know in in our nature trying to suppress the truth of god uh, moving away from god and it's it's only by god's grace that we that we do come to him and and by the spirit at work in us and so if somebody doesn't have the holy spirit um then then there is no hope mm-hmm. um and and that's devastating and so you know we we have to we have to share we have to to tell the truth about um, what God has done for us uh, in Christ, uh, because, you know, as a, a gracious and loving God, uh, this is, you know, he has offered a way to salvation. Yeah. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, in, you know, in that, um, that the fact that we, like, if we believe this doctrine to be true, that people who are, you know, outside of Christ's family currently out, you know, they, they have not yet come to know the Lord. Um, that should make, you know, make us humble, as you said earlier, and then also drive us to, uh, you know, be a, a deliverer of the good news, uh, to these people. I think of, you know, there's that kind of famous, um, video. I I don't know if it's famous, but it it was widely circulated when it came out of, uh, Penn Jillette, who's one of the, Mm, um, comedians from Penn and Teller. Yeah. And if I remember the, the backstory correctly, there was somebody who came to one of his shows and did like the meet and greet. And he was like, Hey, you know, I enjoy your comedy. Um, whatever reason the Lord's placed this burden on my heart, I pray for you regularly. Here's a Bible. Mm. I think that like truth is, is, is in this, you know, and I'd love for you to read it. And I, you know, pray that the Lord would save you. Um, and then, Penn responds and he says, I don't actually believe anything this guy believes, but I appreciate the way that he is, um, actually, you know, you know, he, he would believe, you know, obviously this guy holds, I don't know what, you know, but a a Christian point of view that Penn is, is under God's judgment, uh, and apart from Christ. And so he says, like, if you think somebody is going to die and, um, suffer eternity apart from God, why would you not share the good news with Mm -hmm. them? And so he's like, even though I don't agree with this guy, I appreciate that he was willing to say something because how many people, um, you know, don't say something. And so it's like, if we believe that, I think this, this doctrine actually should cause us. And I, you know, this is an, an oftentimes a, a knock against these, these doctrines uh, of grace that, you know, if, if everybody, you know, if God's elect are just saved, then why is evangelism necessary? And because God's going to save who he's going to save, but we don't know, we don't know who God's going to save and we don't know the means and the methods that he's going to use to save this people for himself. And so if we believe that people are, um, you know, going to going to sit under the judgment of the God of the universe, then why wouldn't we one be humbled ourselves that he's been kind and gracious enough to open our eyes and to bring us to spiritual life. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, share that truth with others so that they may hopefully have life. Um, Cause apart from God's work in them and their heart being kind of made willing to, to, to trust in, uh, the good news of, uh, of the gospel that they, they, they won't. And so, um, yeah, I think those are two things that, as you were talking, that came to mind, like one, we should just, as we think about this, the fact that we were dead and are alive in Christ, that, you know, the old uh, has passed away and that we are in Christ, a new creation, uh, should, should just kind of make us humbly worship at the feet of, uh, of our King. What, and also, drive us to share that with our neighbors and with people around the world and it should drive missions and like, you know, locally, globally, uh, and, and everything else, because we know 
that our condition on our own is dire and their condition on their own is dire. And so those are just two things that, that came to mind as, uh, as, as you were talking, um, as we think about this, um, you know, this idea of total depravity, the, you know, we're a new creation in Christ. Does that mean that like sin is gone? Are we still totally depraved after salvation? How do we, how do we think about those things? Well, I would say, um, we have died to sin, um, but we we right now live, you know, between the ages. And, and so we're in the already and the not yet and, and the flesh still wages war. You know, we're, we're still in our flesh. We're not in our, our new eternal bodies. And so um, there is still sin capacity in us. And uh, so, but what we couldn't do before we were in Christ is produce any kind of goodness in us. You know, we were under the the judgment of the law, um, but in Christ, we are freed from the law. Um, we, we still submit to the law. You know, we still carry out God's commands, um, but we're no longer under God's wrath and judgment because of the finished work of Christ on the cross, because of his life, death, and resurrection. And so, again, taking any of the work off of us, we're living in, in grace uh, but but now, you know, the Holy Spirit has has come to us and, and uh, applies our sanctification. I mean, sorry, applies our salvation to us. And so we continue to grow and we're renewed day by day uh, as we are are formed into the image of Christ. And, and so we're being and I think it's important to say also that we are being prepared for eternity with God. And so, um, you know, being on the other side of. Uh, you know, being dead in your sins and now being alive uh, to to Christ um, it is not about okay. Now we're we've had some like goodness dust sprinkled on us and we can go about our way. It's it's that we've actually died to the selves that we were and we've uh, been born again. You know, to to use very biblical terms. Uh, to the the life uh, that that God has called us into, which is life with Him, and so. Um, so yeah, so so day by day, I mean, we we still are going to be wrestling with sin, uh, you know, uh, and and that's going to be an ongoing uh, battle and until the day that that we are uh, with Christ. Um, you know, Paul says in Romans seven, uh, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Um, and and we could get into a whole discussion about you know actions and. Um, agency and all those kinds of things but but he you know he's he's acknowledging there and he, and he already knows he's testifying you know to to the gospel um, and yet he says I know that nothing good dwells in me I know that in my flesh you know that that's dead that's gonna all pass away um, but uh, but I, I am gonna have a body so I'm not trying to you know I'm also not trying to get into that um, but but hopefully that hopefully people understand that you know that um, that innately in, in our flesh which which still uh, is there you know as we are awaiting the return of Christ or, you know, to, to go be with the Lord. Um, we, we still have this capacity to sin, but we also have the power of Christ um, and, and the Holy Spirit, which enables us uh, not to. Mm. And, and so we can, uh, you know, choose to be obedient by the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in us and in the power of Christ because he's uh, risen from the dead. You know, we, we now can walk uh, in holiness. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, in, especially in our, our day and age, like, and, and, and when we are in our flesh, that just doesn't always sound that great to us, you know, but, but that actually is the, the beautiful, uh, eternal reality that, that we have, you know, to, to be, uh, be, be made day by day, uh, into holy people who are being set apart, who have been set apart and are set apart, uh, and, and are being prepared for God. So that was like a really long winded rambling answer, but those are just some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that was really good. Um, what, you know, one of the, the things that as I, as I sit here and think on this and as we're having this conversation, one of the things that comes to mind in that idea of evangelism and, and sharing, um, like really this, this doctrine helping to drive and see the need for evangelism and to see how bad we really we really are, um, and to wrestle with that and for us to rightly see ourselves in view of, uh, the Lord and at the same time, um, you know, be 
kind of humbly and graciously blown away by the way that he has saved us. Like, I think there is this temptation in, in me and probably in others because of, um, this idea that it's easy to see ourselves as good in the context of this world and struggle to see ourselves as this bad in view of, uh, in view of, of God and, and his, his laws and his standards, um, you know, kind of apart from Christ. And so I, I, I just am thinking about that, that there, there's a huge difference, um, in how that could be a barrier for oftentimes for people to, to, you know, who are being evangelized to, to think, well, no, I'm not, I'm not that bad. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty you know, I'm a pretty good person when I, you know, when I compare myself to, to my neighbors or to other people that I see, you know, around. So it's like, what do I really, like, what do I really need to be saved from? Mm -hmm. And so I think in some ways having a right view of this, this, this doctrine and being able to articulate that and being able to share with people, um, in a, in a middle-class American context, like, yeah, you might be good compared to in, in a kind of moralistic kind of society, you know, view of society or, you know, I don't know, like people in history who are terrible, um, like, you know, but to think, oh, well, I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty good. I do some good things. I, but to think about that in view of the fact that, well, apart from Christ, none of what we do is good and like at all, you know, it's, it's not good. I mean, it's good for our neighbor maybe. And that may be a glimpse of the goodness of the Lord, you know, in the same way that you can see a glimpse of God in creation. Like there, there, there are glimpses of God that are seen through righteous acts and and caring for others and, um, serving the least of these. But, you know, the scriptures would say that like, they aren't good uh, because the motives are not, they're not, by faith, um, you know, there's always some sort of self-serving or, um, you know, works-based righteousness or something that's, that's, if, if we really dig deep, that's ultimately driving that. And so I just think like the, the ability to, to frame depravity in the, in, of the person in relation to God and who he is and what he said and the standard Mm -hmm. that he has set, uh, is just critical as we think about sharing the gospel and understanding what we ourselves have been saved from. Cause I think sometimes it's tempting to go, well, I wasn't, I wasn't that bad. Right. No, I think that's right. And it, it is very tempting to think, um, you know, to, to not want to see ourselves as, I mean, nobody likes to think about themselves as totally depraved. And I, I, but I actually think that, you know, we probably don't spend enough time really grappling with that reality Um, even now, you know, I, it's a lot more, uh, encouraging and and hopeful to, to think about, you know, that, that I am a new creation, Mm -hmm. but even that, you know, I I think so often we, we kind of settle for, uh, you know, as Christians, okay, I'm in Christ and, you know, maybe I've, I've moved away from, you know, the, the sins, former sins of my former life. Uh, but, but now I'm, you know, I'm following Jesus, but like, you know, it, it, we so easily can slip back into moralism, you mm-hmm. know, to, to think, to, to be thinking about ourselves as, you know, like I'm, I'm not that bad of a person, you know, I'm just like not perfect or, you know, I'm just still being sanctified, you know, but, but it, so I, so I think, you know, even as we move, um, closer and closer day by day into the eternal reality that, that we are destined for in Christ, uh, to have that, that knowledge of you know the the total depravity that that we were born into in mind is so helpful and also to have uh the the great promise of what we will be forever with christ in christ um you know that what we have what we have in christ and in his righteousness um to have both of those things i think always before us is is probably the best way to move through the christian life um and uh, I just want to read, you know, in first John, uh, speaks very, you know, directly to, um, to the reality again of, of our sin nature. First John chapter one, verses uh, eight through 10 says, and, and this is, this is like the promise that we have too. He says, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And so, uh, if in rejecting the notion of total depravity, um, we, 
when we reject the notion of total depravity, uh, that's what I draw from this, uh, that that we are, are lying to ourselves, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Like, so if we're telling ourselves, you know, I, I'm, I may not be a perfect person, but I'm not like fully immersed in a, I don't have a, you know, a sin nature that reaches into every part of my being, mm-hmm. uh, then the truth is not in me. Then I am not believing what the scriptures tell us. But then in verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, and so, you know, what what two, those are two really great verses in, in the Bible, you know, that we have to come to terms with um, and, and be broken over the reality of our sin. And then we are immediately met with uh, the, the promise of the gospel Mm. you know that if we confess our sins we trust in the righteousness of christ uh that god is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins you know he um even we see throughout the scriptures you know he passed over former sins to show his righteousness uh, and he cleanses us from our sin and then we are made uh into you know people who who will spend eternity with him and so gosh that's so encouraging to me um and i know a lot of people will say we that it understanding total depravity um, kind of illuminates the rest of the doctrines of grace that we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's true. I can totally understand and sympathize with, um, you know, with taking issue with one or, or, you know, more than one of the doctrines. Like these are big things to think about. Um, And so I don't think that we should say, you know, okay, let me just run down the list, check, 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 check. Okay, I'm good. Move along. Like these are, these like total depravity is a, is something that whether we are consciously thinking of it, you know, as like capital T, capital D, total depravity or not, Mm -hmm. like that we're dealing with every day. Um, And so we ought to be thinking about these things and and contemplating them as they work themselves out, you know, in our lives as as people who are following Christ. Um, But I mean, of course, it's it's very difficult and, and even overwhelming uh, to think about, but I think once we do understand that, the mercy and the grace of God uh, is just even that more, oh, even that more, <laughs> even more overwhelming. Uh, so overwhelming, I can't even form a sentence uh, to to see, you know, what He has has given to us in Christ. Yeah, you know, as you were kind of sharing that insight from First uh, John, which was was really good, and I like I love that. Yeah, it's like. If you dis- if you deny that you have sin, like you you essentially you are in sin, but the ability to um, uh, confess and that that Jesus is faithful, Lord is faithful to forgive us when we do it was just a, that was I think that was a really uh, insightful and and helpful kind of framework for for thinking about those things, and it made me think of a few, you know kind of the end, well a part of Ephesians two. Um, you know, where it says, but God, so it just, you know, beginning of this chapter is you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked, you know, according to the ways of this world. And then it says, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ. And it's like, and then by grace, you have been saved. It's that same, that sort of that same idea that, you know, yes, like, the depravity is is very much a part of our human condition um you know and 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 even in christ we still live in a world that is affected uh by that depravity and and we aren't um we are being sanctified um but we are not yet glorified and so we still struggle with the desires of the flesh uh and uh, we we still walk sometimes in the ways of the world, even though we are united with Christ and we are a new creation. Uh, but you know, thankfully, as we think about this in the context of salvation and the way that the Lord has worked in us and is working in us, that that even though we were dead in our sins, that He was gracious uh, to 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 make us alive together with Christ. And it's not, I think, that it's important for us to think about that. Like, it doesn't say because of. You know that that passage isn't because of the great love that you had for the for God, when you were dead in your transgressions, right. He made you alive, like or or you made yourself alive. But in the context of this, it's no God who was the one who was rich in mercy, um, because of His love for His people, 
those that that he has saved uh you know that that or or and will save we were dead and now we are alive and and i think that does prove the point that you were making too that all of these these five doctrines of grace they tie together um and to see the the you know the i would even say the beauty of the other four we have to first see sort of the darkness and, and look at you know and kind of dwell on the fact that yeah, we're 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 not we're not good, um, you know, apart apart from Christ, and so uh, that 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 sin has impacted us um, at, at every level and in every way, and it doesn't mean we're as bad as we could be, um, you know. Like I'm sure there was something redemptive. I don't know if redemptive is the right word, but like there were parts of Hitler or other terrible people, like they could have been worse, you know. Right. Um, we I I could have been worse. I could be worse, but. Um, but that, that sin, you know, I think, is it Jeremiah 17 that says the heart is more deceitful than all else and is Mm -hmm. desperately sick. Like, I mean, it's, you know, it doesn't mean it couldn't be sicker, but it's sick. And so it's going to affect us all. And so if we see, you know, God's kind of grace in our election and his, his pursuit of us and his holding us and keeping us in the way that, um, you know, the atonement kind of saves, uh, God's people, we can't see the the glorious beauty of that without also saying, yeah, we, we were dead. We Apart from Christ, there is nothing to save us. Uh, so I just think that that's a helpful point to say, yeah, these all tie together. They all flow, um, you know, kind of in a, in a way out of out of this one. Yeah, no, I think that's good. Um, I just want to read two quotes from John Calvin um, that, that I think are helpful for this discussion because if you're listening to this and you're thinking okay now I'm going to go around and look at every single person as you know totally depraved that may help you I don't know it may help us have some grace for people you know it's like well they're you know they're totally depraved so just like me um (laughs) but um but but if if it's like okay well what does that mean now for how I should view people and how I should view um even you know, my, my salvation and my being, you know, justified by faith, you know, not by works, um, because as we've thoroughly discussed, there's, there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. Um, just, just what is, what is helpful moving forward? I I find these two quotes are are both helpful. The first one uh, is from the Institute's, uh, John Calvin. Um, and it says, we are not to reflect on the wickedness of men, but to look to the image of God in them, an image which covering and obliterating their faults an image which by its beauty and dignity should allure us to love and embrace them. And I think that's just like a beautiful way to think about humanity. Um, Again, going back to the point that you made, uh, you know, I think drawing on R.C. Sproul that um, we, we are totally depraved, uh, but we are not utterly depraved. There's, there's a difference, Mm -hmm. you know, now, I mean, I don't, there's, I don't think we could know whether, whether we are or not, you know, but, but yeah, I'm sure to, to some degree we could always be, uh, worse, but that's not the point. The point mm-hmm. is that we're, you know, we are totally depraved. Um, and, and yet, uh, because we see the image of God in every person, uh, that, that allows us to look upon people and to love them because God loves them and, uh, and even to love ourselves because God loves us. And, and for those of us in Christ, you know, has called us to himself. And so, um, you know, that, that should hopefully help encourage us to, to remember that, uh, when when we place our faith in Christ, you know, God removes all of our sin and also, you know, our shame. Um, and mm-hmm. so anything that comes after that, you know, we, we are tempted by the enemy who wants to, you know, kind of bury us back again in shame, you know, and, and draw us back to, to our old life and, and we're to reject that. Um, so I thought that was really good. And then uh, the other quote that I, I just wanted to offer uh, from Calvin uh, says, uh, this is an excerpt, says, a man will be justified by faith when excluded from righteousness of works. He by faith lays hold of the righteousness of Christ and clothed in it appears in the sight of God, not as a sinner, but as righteous. Uh, and and that's the end, you know, that, that we are headed towards um, in Christ. Again, none of it by our own works, none of it even by our own choosing or prompting or, uh, you know, anything (laughs) but just uh completely living in the grace of god and uh that that i think is is just incredible yeah i think that's a a good uh place to end this discussion on uh the doctrine i think that summed it up well and 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 leaves us with maybe a, a right view of the lord and a right view of us and um a desire to see other people come to know the lord and see their their beauty and humanity um even in the midst of 
the, the depravity and, and the wickedness and that we would hopefully point people to I don't even know wow, what. Wow, it's just removed to worship. Yeah, wow. I, I was like, I don't even know. That wasn't my computer, but um, it must was have mine. been yours. Yeah, it was, which is weird because it's closed. But it's um, just resonating with the truth. So. Yeah, I was gonna say that was like the choir of angels. <laughs> um, hopefully the mics picked that up because if it didn't, it'd be really hot. With people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, it was the little Apple, like uh, you know, choral yeah. sound or whatever for those listening I'm not at home. Do it because I, <laughs> I have a t- I have a totally depraved voice, so. That, that's where total depravity has, has impacted you the most. Yes. Um, but uh, I, I totally lost my train of thought. But anyways, hopefully this was a, a good discussion uh, and helpful discussion for uh, setting the framework for the next few weeks. We'll be jumping into uh, unconditional election next. Uh, and so if if you want, there are some there are some lots of resources out there. Ligonier Ministries uh, certainly has quite a bit on on these topics, um, Desiring God as well, which I think we mentioned. There is uh, a book uh, called The Doctrines of Grace um, by uh, James, is it James Montgomery Boyce, maybe? Uh, yeah, and Philip Ryken, I think. And then... Um, uh, proof is another one, which is another acronym for for these five uh, doctrines of grace. And, and hey, it's summer, so maybe just pick up the institutes. And there you do, go. Do yeah, some yeah. If you want to read Calvin, um, where it all came from, <laughs> the primary that would be, source. That would be a a, a great start. So, um, as we as we transition into <laughs> the local on tap, oh man. Um, I was going to say, do we say like where our city is most depraved or where depravity thrives? It's like, what's the, what's the Petri dish of depravity in Tallahassee? Um. (laughs) Oh man. Well, I do remember uh, leaving from our good Friday service at Ruby Diamond Auditorium one year. And, you know, that's such like a somber, reflective, or I think if there's any service where, where there's this collective reverence among all of us uh, in our church, that's it's, certainly it. it's that service, yeah. you know, the, the tone is set on Good Friday and we walk out, you know, and it's of course, okay, we're heading into Saturday, you know, that's always a, you know, kind of just a reflective day. And then Sunday, you know, you're just looking forward in anticipation to the celebration of the resurrection. And, you know, we double doors open and we walk out onto, you know, the uh, concourse or whatever you want to call it outside of uh, Mm, Westcott. Yeah, little plaza area. And there is just a full on like party going on (laughs) in the Westcott Fountain. I mean, maximum uh, bodies in the fountain, minimal clothing. (laughs) Maybe maximal intoxication levels. <laughs> there's just, yeah. there's a lot happening there. Uh, and so that, you know, I mean, we're like, okay, that's why we're a church in our city, yeah. you know, because there, there is depravity among us. And, you know, I mean, in, you know, in all of us too. So I'm, I'm not yeah, trying like, to and, be judgmental. And such were some of you. Not, right. not, you, they, not you literally. <laughs> but, yeah, I have but, not <laughs> gone swimming in the West Coast Fountain. Um, um, but yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I was gonna say, like, I mean, to, to your point, it's like, why do we exist? Like, who are we trying to reach? It's those, it's those people. In the same way that it's the people not in the fountain, but right, um, right. Yeah, yeah. I think there's plenty of places around campus that um, depravity is on display. Um, maybe bonefish on Wednesday nights as well uh, oh, for a different crowd. Um, but you, said uh, it, Alex. you know, without um, without putting too many people on blast, maybe we'll <laughs> just wind this one down and. Uh, <laughs> We'll look forward to uh, to next week where we uh, dive into unconditional election and, and, and talk about uh, God's you know purposes in saving us uh, as we continue through these doctrines of grace. And Dean will be back with us next week. So for all of you anticipating a LaCroix top popping, you'll you know have that itch scratched next week and uh hopefully producer jacob decides to come back and uh, wasn't uh, you know <laughs> too harassed so uh we'd love if you would uh subscribe if you haven't uh share this with friends let people know we'd love uh, for this to to, to be uh, impactful for them as well thanks for listening and we'll see you next week Thanks for listening to The Local Dive, a podcast diving into deep and shallow musings about Christ, the church, and culture. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can follow The Local Dive on social media and continue the conversation with us on Instagram and Twitter at The Local Dive Pod.